You're jumping into CKCU programming through our audio archive, supported by you, the listener. Good morning. You're tuned in to Aluta Continua here on CKCU 93.1 FM. I'm Monique Fuller. Joining me on Aluta Continua this morning is filmmaker and wellness expert Tamar Solomon to discuss his documentary, The Great Disconnect, that is screening this weekend as part of the Ottawa Canadian Film Festival. But before that, I'll be checking in with festival co-founder, Jif Paul. Hello, Jif, and welcome to Aluta Continua. Thank you. So, Jif, can we start off with the programming for this coming weekend? Yeah, we. Um, so all three weekends, we've had a feature film and a block of five short films. Um, this week, uh, we have The Great Disconnect, and we're really happy because it's, uh, it's an Ottawa-based uh, crew that put this movie together. And it talks about uh, social isolation. This was made way before the pandemic. So it, it's kind of interesting to get a perspective of where we are now and then look back at um, the, the issues with people kind of being more and more connected, but being less and less really connected as people. Um, so, and, and then we have a group of five short films uh, from all over the country um, that follows that. And this will be the end, the third weekend of our three weekend festival. And is there a theme that runs through the five short films? Can you tell us maybe a little bit more information about them? Um, there's a variety. So there's um, comedy, there's a documentary, which is really interesting as well. So there's a comedy called Not Your Average Bear from Vancouver about someone who's um, coming up with innovative ways to uh, get around being unemployed um, to a documentary called Guardians of the Grasslands um, about you know sustainability and uh, it may not go where you think it goes. Uh, I don't wanna say too much about it because that will kind of spoil it. And uh, there's a sci-fi tessellate. Uh, there's a somewhat experimental music film and also for youth. And I hope they remember my name is also um, a documentary about a blogger. So what has this been like for you as a festival organizer? I mean, the obvious thing is the festival is now virtual. And of course, when you initially started planning this festival, the intention was that it wasn't meant to be virtual. It was meant to be an in-person event. So now that you've had to switch to virtual, what has that meant for you as an organizer and in terms of planning and logistics? Uh, well, we, we made the decision in July because um, we didn't see this changing anytime soon. Um, up to that point, the process had, had been pretty much the same as a physical festival. We do all our jury and film selection and all of that is done online. So nothing changed in that kind of vein. Uh, we did go back to the filmmakers, though, and double check that they were OK with us being an online festival, because um, depending on other festivals they've applied to, there are some um, that have criteria that prevent you from having your film online at another festival. So we gave the, the filmmakers an opportunity to withdraw their film if this wasn't a format that will work for them. Um, and we had very few, I think, uh, just a couple that actually decided to go that way. So from that point, we were planning on expanding this year to a three-day physical festival. We were two days last year. And uh, so we wanted to expand the number of films that we could show. Um, so when we decided to do it online, we were no longer constrained with uh, booking a venue for an, a certain number of days. So rather than have them three days back to back, we could then kind of expand it out to make it three different weekends. So we have 18 films this time around, 15 shorts and three features. You're not stuck trying to watch all of them in one weekend. Uh, you can take your time. Um, the other thing that made it different this year is by putting them online, uh, we haven't geo-restricted the films. So in fact, the audience is much broader than it would have been at a physical festival because you could then cater, like these films can be viewed by people anywhere in the world right now. Um, so that's an advantage as well. But at the same time, we do understand as a filmmaker, not getting that immediate reaction of an audience is kind of something that's lacking. Uh, but, you know, we do the best we can. How does this work for the viewer? How does this work for the folks that are attending the festival? If you could sort of just walk us through what that experience is like. I'm assuming that many people have already 
taken part or have been a part of a virtual audience, but I'm sure that many people haven't. So I'm thinking for those who haven't done it yet, how would you describe that process or that experience? Um, it is no different than renting a film on a streaming service that you happen to have. So we have a website set up with the, with the program on it. And there are buttons uh, marked watch beside each block or feature film. So you click the, the button and it takes you to our online platform where the films are actually hosted. It's called Vimeo. It's a respected platform amongst filmmakers may not be as familiar to the general public, but it's pretty much like a YouTube, except there's no advertising and you're not, you know, competing with cat videos and everything else that that's on YouTube. Uh, so it's a curated uh, platform. So you do need a, an account in order to rent films, but getting an account is free. And the reason uh, you need an account is once you rent the film, you can use any device you have. And as long as you log into Vimeo with those credentials, you'll be able to stream the films you've rented for the rental period, which in our case is 24 hours. So you rent a film on Friday night, you can watch it as many times as you want till Saturday night. You can rent it again on Saturday if you want to watch it for another 24 hours. So Jeff, because the festival is now held virtually, you won't be having a standard or a traditional Q&A. How have you worked your way around that for audiences to still get an opportunity to have a Q&A session or ask questions to the filmmakers about their project or documentary? Uh, if you follow us on social media, we will be posting a link um, that'll allow audience members to ask questions, or you can actually upvote questions that have already been asked. So if you have the same question, you can just bump it up higher in the queue. And um, the weekend, after the weekend's films have screened, um, we will be recording a panel with some of the filmmakers, and those questions will be incorporated in, and we'll post... Um, the Q&A edited piece uh, as we did in the past two weekends online the week after the festival. And how have audiences found the virtual festival? It's, it's hard to say because we don't have a lot to compare it to um, doing this. We're doing a lot of things virtually now. So um, it, I think it's, it's nice from what we hear, it's audiences like the fact that they can stop and start movies whenever they want. Um, they can make up their own schedule. Uh, within the weekend, which is kind of a thing. I guess also the fact that you don't have to go somewhere, get ready and go somewhere and coordinate schedules and things like that. But, you know, on the down downside of that is you don't get the same communal experience that you would um, seeing the movie together with other people. So once again, Jeff, thank you very much for joining us here on Aluta Continua and good luck with the final weekend of the festival. Thank you very much. That was the Ottawa Canadian Film Festival co-founder, Jif Paul. This is the festival's last weekend. Please check out their website at www.ocanfilmfest.ca slash ocanfilmfest2020. Next up, I'll be airing my interview with local filmmaker and wellness expert, Tamar Solomon, about his documentary, The Great Disconnect, that takes a deeper look at modern loneliness and isolation. Hello, Tamar, and welcome to Aluta Continua. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Monique. Such a pleasure. So let's get started and talk about this very interesting and timely film, The Great Disconnect. And when I say timely, I say that uh, not even ironically. I think this film is, it just couldn't have come at a better time. Let's put it that way in terms of where we sit with this pandemic. And basically at the beginning of the film, you talk about a trip to the Blue Mountains in Jamaica. What was it about that particular community that struck you as particular or unique? And also maybe just tell me a little bit about why you went to Jamaica in the first place. Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. That's a great question. Um, I think it really just sets the tone for really how the film came to be. And, and when audiences will watch the film, um, like you said, I end up in the mountain of, of Jamaica. And the reason that we ended up in the mountains of Jamaica is because I was living in the Caribbean at the time. And uh, I was, I had a great friend who was a Rastafarian and our, in, our initial vision for the film um, was going to sort of contrast how this Rastafarian community um, that I was able to uh, go up and film um, with my, my friend, Rob, who's a cinematographer of the film, um, you know, with our guide who was this Rastafarian. So the reason we went to Jamaica was because we can get into these remote areas 
and we envisioned this beautiful cinematography contrasting sort of how this Rastafarian community was living. And what we were interested in initially uh, and how we had scripted our film was that, you know, what could this Rastafarian community teach the fast paced North, North American world basically. Um, and we had several topics we wanted to look into, you know, nutrition. So, you know, Rastafarians have a very interesting, um, it, you know, their diet is very interesting. Their spirituality is very interesting. And so I thought we, we could really have this uh, beautiful artistic piece showing the cinematography of Jamaica and then going back into North American cities and sort of contrasting. It. Um, and what happened was, is that, you know, when you're scripting initially, you're obviously trying to narrow down, you know, what's, what's the one thing that you can, or are people going to take away? You know, I'm a holistic nutritionist to begin with. And so I'm very interested in sort of, you know, what are the things that I can teach people um, about health? And, you know, when I went up into the Rastafarian community, what took me um, aback really, what really captivated me was their sense of community. So their diet was really interesting. Um, how they ate off the land was really interesting. How they sort of had a natural way to exercise by, you know, going up and down the mountain was really interesting. But what um, was really interesting was the sense of community. And, and what I know about longevity and happiness by reading multiple books on like the longest living societies in the world um, is that, yes, they do eat well and they do exercise, but tucked away in multiple chapters and then a lot of research about long living societies is how socially connected and community oriented they are. And if you read a lot of popular media or a lot of research material here in North America, you'll see that, you know, there's multiple topics you know, a lot of the, a lot of journalists are covering um, this idea that in North America, we are struggling with loneliness and social isolation, and we have community breakdown. And so um, I, you know, I, you know, just by coming across all these sources, you know, it, you know, my brain started to kind of, you know, fire off. And basically, when we sat back down with the script writer, who's my wife, um, and she's, she, her name's Sarah Douglas, she's a story editor and writer, and the producers, and we said, look, um, you know, we need to narrow down this topic to this idea of community. There's just too many topics about it, but nobody really talks about it, right? If you think about just the average person walking around, they're not thinking about, hey, how am I going to uh, improve my community? I mean, some people are, uh, but not a lot of people. And so we thought we had something interesting. We had no idea what it would turn into. Uh, but then we started to reach out to, you know, multiple experts in the field, you know, urban designers, psychologists, economists, community activists. Um, and they basically sort of guided us to what the film ended up to be, um, which is what uh, audience will see as the great disconnect. So there, you know, to, to answer to answer you the best possible way, that's that's why Jamaica is basically, a, you know, is the spark of of what the film became. And that's very interesting in terms of process in regards to what it's like to make a documentary as opposed to a narrative film you start off thinking you're gonna tell one story and then another story wants to be told. How did that pivot happen and was that difficult? I mean, you do explain a little bit about that process, but in terms of having a particular story that you wanna tell, so that's that's where you're heading. And then all of a sudden you're, you're pivoting to something completely different. How does that work out in terms of process? That's a, that, it, very great, I love that question, Monique. I'll tell you why, multiple challenges with that. You know, you write the treatment, you raise the funds, your executive producers, the investors think you're going to make a film that is basically sold on the idea of the cinematography within the Caribbean. And this was the concept. So it's going back to our executive producers and saying, we can't, we're, I, don't, I don't, we don't see ourselves going back to Jamaica too much. We feel like the film is heading in a completely different direction. So that's, that's one challenge, right? Is that you, you got to go back and be very persuasive and you're, Producers have to trust you in that, okay, you know, it's shifting. Uh, the other thing, just from the challenge of just sort of trusting your intuition. So, you know, you know, Sarah Douglas, the story editor and writer, multiple challenges, you know, with where is this heading? You know, what are we now pulling from the interviewees that we may have thought that we weren't going to use? Um, from, a, from a production standpoint, you know, I had to sort of kind of figure out you know, I, how, you know, where am I, where are we going to go to really get what we need for, for this sort of film? So there's multiple challenges from the standpoint of just creativity. And then obviously dealing with, you know, what you, what you sold the idea from the, to begin with, but you know, what, what was great is that, you know, there are multiple examples where the script evolves, the story evolves and you have to let it evolve. And I think there's a, a, a gap there, you know, and, and, 
the Q and A with OCAM, you know, that was one of the questions that they asked us was sort of, um, what would you give uh, as far as advice to like, you know, aspiring filmmakers? And the one thing is that just follow your intuition, allow the, the script to evolve. And if, if you let it and you really, you follow your gut and you, you know, you get some good mentorship, um, I think you can, you can make a, you can make a great film, so. That's really interesting. And I was thinking as you were talking that I did say, or I think I alluded to the fact that it might be different with narrative film. And I don't think it is actually, but I definitely think with documentaries, it's a very different process because with a narrative film, you can drive the story, you can change the story. There's lots of things that you can do because it's completely an imaginative um, endeavor. Whereas with a documentary, it's not the same uh, process. So in many ways, a documentary film can take you on a ride. It's not you necessarily driving the story. The story can actually basically ask you to get in and then say, this is the direction that I want to go in. Totally. I mean, a great example uh, of a film that's done, you know, that's a phenomenal film is this film called Icarus, which is basically, um, it's playing on Netflix and it's about this cyclist who basically um, experiments on himself um, with, you know, the, the whole sort of doping um, that ended up happening with you know the Russian athletes and and all the sorts of stuff and there was a you know you knew exactly what the script was about you can almost tell what the film was about but then there was a golden moment within the film where something happens and you know you had to pivot because the story um, the story just ended up pivoting and so we we pivoted largely because we just felt like uh, you know we we you know we we were captivated by something we went back to our script. Um, we thought that we would be stretching it too much if we went into all these different directions. Um, and we felt like this topic of community could be really, really important. So it's just, it's a matter of intuition. It's a matter of working with your team. You know, we had a great mentor who worked at, in film at an extremely high level. So, you know, to, so this was a very, very team oriented um, production. And, you know, the great thing though, it's a, it's a very human film. So a lot of things that you see in The Great Disconnect are just things that I think everybody kind of comes across, but never really thinks about. And so I think what's, what's great about our film or what we love about it is that we have things that are quite tangible that people take away from the film and it answers a lot of questions that, you know, we're all sort of asking ourselves. So there's you know, a few themes that we cover in the film. Um, the first is one of the interesting things people will realize is you know, this concept of urban design. And so I live in a condo, for example, which is different from someone who lives on a street with a front porch and a sidewalk where people are walking all the time. So I have less of a chance to interact with my neighbors, for example. So to create community within my condominium requires quite a bit of me getting out of my comfort zone and trying to do things within my condominium. And so the concept of urban design and sort of, you know, uh, the relation to social isolation and, and loneliness is gonna be, I think, something that people are gonna find quite interesting. Um, we talk a lot about individuality. So we live in a world where, you know, it's kind of all about us, right? It's, you know, it's, you know, self-care. Uh, what am I doing for me? You know, career aspirations. So we are overvaluing the materialistic things, you know, like, you know, houses, money versus, you know, spirituality, community, friendships. So we talk about that in the film. And then the third piece, which is technology and social media. So, you know, the social dilemmas of a, a film that's, um, doing, you know, doing its run on Netflix and, and people are really realizing how um, that regardless of how connected we can be um, through our technological and social devices, they can actually also be a huge piece in disconnecting us. And so we delve into those three topics within the film. Um, we don't go extremely deep, but we raise questions. And I think what, what's great, what people take away from the film is sort of um, a conversation starter as to where they can make changes in improving their community. It's interesting that you would characterize the film as a conversation starter because I think this film has landed at a time where the conversation has already been started in part because of COVID-19. And I can't help but think how the timing of this film is so uncanny. Your instincts were right on the money, so to speak, yeah. because this film really couldn't have come at a better time because a lot of these topics that are dealt with and discussed in the film are things that we are discussing right now because of COVID-19 and the isolation that it imposes. And it's, 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 what would I want to say? And the fact that COVID-19 has made us more dependent on technology. And we're also realizing that that's not 
enough that we still want to congregate and be together. So, I mean, again, all of the things that you've been talking about in the film and even in this interview really are so timely. And there was one particular quote that really stood out for me, and it was by Paul Bourne, the president of Tamarack. And at the beginning of the film, he talks about the challenge between individuality and community, and that's something that you mentioned. And for me, that's the one thing that COVID really revealed to me. What has COVID revealed to you in terms of this idea of a great disconnect? And what lessons do you think we can take away in regards to building better communities and better communication? Well, you know, you, you said it, I think you said it well, um, Monique, in that, you know, we, this film was produced before COVID even happened. And the pandemic has just exacerbated, um, you know, a lot of things. So if you were already sort of in that state of, you know, feeling lonely or social isolation or that, you know, you don't have community, whatever it is in your life is causing you to not have as many social relationships as you should have. Um, you know, I often wonder, what if you were more heavily invested in your community prior to the pandemic? Would you be sort of, you know, doing better throughout this pandemic? And like, like you said, th this does not replace real life interactions, real life face-to-face -face interactions. We know this from the research. There's a fantastic book called Reclaiming Conversation by Sherry Turkel, who um, we have uh, different TED clips within the film, um, who just shows over and over that, you know, all these technological devices, as great as they've become, I mean, this is great, right? You and I, Monique, are connecting. We, we obviously can't congregate face to face because of, of the pandemic, but we were able to have this discussion. But it would be significantly better um, if we could, if we could be sitting in front of each other, having a coffee, having those discussions. There's something very human about that. That is how we have evolved as humans. Um, and so I think that that's really, really important. So as we get through the pandemic, you know, without these tools, I, I, I think it would be much worse, but I think it's just realizing that they don't replace um, real face-to-face -face interactions and that once the pandemic is over, that we can create a balance and that we can come back to uh, making sure that we are getting together um, in, in multiple capacities. Now, you know, you go back to Paul Bourne's quote about individualistic and being more collective. And I think there's two themes in the films that really arise, and I, I'm going to assume that you you, you probably saw them. The first is that we talk about friendship and social relationships. And that's just, you know, the light, um, the, the good friendships we have. And then there's the other aspect of legitimately making the world a better place. And so, you know, we talk about community in that sense. We talk about, you have your friendships where you have pints with and you go to parties with and you tell your secrets uh, to. And then there's things you do in the community planting a garden, getting involved at your kid's high school and starting a chess club for kids who like chess, um, helping the elderly live a more comfortable life in their later stages of, of their, you know, there's multiple things we need to do um, to make the world a better place. And so we talk about, about both aspects of, of community and social relationships. And I think that that's what um, is really gonna hit people in the film. That was filmmaker and wellness expert Tamar Solomon. You can see his documentary this weekend as part of the Ottawa Canadian Film Festival. I'll be airing part two of our conversation next week. That's it for this edition of Aluta Continua. I'm Monique Fuller signing off until next week.